Welcome to this afternoon's Reviewer Meets Reviewed, this uh, now famous series so beautifully organized by our librarian Ted Goodlift and compared by Hanin. Now, uh, the subject of our discussion today is the book by uh, Professor Graham Jones uh, entitled Magic's Reason, an Anthropology of Analogy and uh, uh, reviewed by Catherine Swancott from King's College London. So we're in for a, a really most entertaining afternoon. And as always, we'll start with a presentation by the author who will describe uh, what he was uh, uh, doing in this work. And then we'll move to the comments from the reviewer. So thank you very much. And the floor is yours, Graham. Great. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Ted. It's such an honor to be here. Um, and thank you to Hanin and uh, to Ted, to David for facilitating this. Um, I'm really excited for the opportunity. And thanks especially to uh, Katie for um, being here in conversation, but also for writing such a lucid um, and uh, provocative review. It's really, as a kind of connoisseur of uh, academic book reviews. It's a beautiful review that really gets to the heart of what's kind of most important to me about the project. And so I'm, I'm really excited about this conversation. I'm just going to share my screen and hope that you will be able to see uh, my slideshow. Uh, it appears to be working. So it's also especially an honor uh, for me to be at an event held under the auspices of the British Museum. Um, during, the, uh, during the quarantine, during the lockdown, one of the things, it, uh, perhaps like David, I was you know, trapped at home with, with my children. Um, and one of the things that we did for amusement was playing board games. Uh, and one of the games that we played, uh, that we learned to play was the Royal Game of Ur, which is the uh, oldest board game uh, in human history. And there's an incredible story about how it was discovered by archeologists, brought to the British Museum, um, and over decades of study, how the rules were reconstituted uh, for the game. And so we, we learned the game um, from the findings of of the British Museum uh, and watched amazing videos about the history of the game posted on the, the museum website. And so I was there in the halls of the museum uh, in spirit for, for some of the kind of most poignant and meaningful parts of the uh, quarantine. But I begin with the story um, because it illuminates something that is particularly important in my work, but that I think uh, is also um, apparent in Professor Swankett's work, which is the imperative of taking play seriously and the importance of what you can learn from taking seriously things that people do uh, for fun. Um, so I'm going to begin this story about um, my book, Magic's Reason, by going back uh, to my previous book, which kind of set the stage for it. Uh, because all of the research kind of emerged from the first project. Uh, my first book is, is called Trade of the Treks. Um, it was published in 2011, and it's an ethnography of the social milieu of French entertainment magicians. Uh, and for the field work for that project, uh, I spent a couple years with magicians in the clubs where they hang out uh, after hours after they're done performing, um, in the classes where expert magi magicians train novices, um, at the parties and social events where they perform close up magic, um, and in the theaters where they perform for large audiences. Uh, one of the parts of, of my research was learning this craft alongside other aspiring magicians. And so here's a picture of me with uh, apparently no gray hair, um, learning to perform as a part of an entrance uh, examination for the largest magician society in France, the Fédération Française des Artistes Prestidigitateurs, uh, which was a lot of fun. But while I was doing this research from the very inception of this project, there was a cloud 
hanging over my head, a, a dark cloud. And the a cloud that that didn't dissipate until I wrote um, I wrote the book that we're discussing today. And so I want to tell you a bit about this um, uh, menacing cloud over my head. So for anybody who knows anything about the history of anthropology, uh, you know that that magic is one of the paramount concepts, one of the paramount topics in the history of our discipline. There are only a few other topics that are arguably of equal importance, perhaps uh, kinship, maybe ritual, but, but magic is one of the major concepts. And when it appears, it often appears, as in the title of these uh, two classic books, in conjunction with two other closely related terms, science and religion. And you see in the kind of conjoining of these three terms that there's an, there's an intentional ca um, calling attention to the relationship between contrastive systems of belief, different systems of belief or explanation of how the world works and how we should think about trying to understand the relationship between different systems of belief and perhaps kind of interpretively mediate between them. Probably the most famous uh, book in this tradition is Witchcraft, Oracles, and Magic Among the Azande by the British anthropologist Evans Pritchard. This is the book. This book for anthropologists is probably like um, the equivalent of, of Citizen Kane and the history of, of cinema. It's the book that made many of us want to become anthropologists in the first place because it's such a magnificent work. And when I was in graduate school, starting to get interested in the topic of magic, I was lucky enough to have as a professor uh, an Africanist who had trained with Evans Pritchard, uh, one of his close students. And so I asked him one day if he would do a reading class with me on the anthropology of magic. And I remember very clearly we were, uh, we were in a long corridor with gray walls and green carpet, a narrow corridor, and he was looking at his mail. And I asked him to do the reading class and he turned to me and he said, waste of time. You do not work on real magic. Your project is awful and you will never get a job. And I turned to run and there was nowhere to run. Um, and so from that moment, that's probably when the cloud appeared over my head, this dark cloud about whether, whether, I, whether or not the project I was doing was legitimate, a legitimate contribution to the anthropology of magic. So if we examine a bit more closely this professor's response to my query, uh, we'll see something interesting. So he differentiated between real magic and I guess what I was doing as fake magic, not real magic. So what is real magic for an anthropologist? Well, I'm just gonna talk a, a bit schematically. We could be much more nuanced in this, but just schematically, uh, we might describe it as ritual activity performed by and for irrational people who falsely believe that they can affect natural laws. In other words, false causal belief, false belief about cause and effect. So what's fake magic by contrast? Well, it's playful entertainment performed by and for rational people who actually know that they cannot violate natural laws. In effect, it's true causal belief. It's accurate, scientifically speaking, accurate causal belief. Now, two terms in this kind of, um, in these columns leap out at me uh, and kind of motivate the project that I'm gonna be talking about today. Irrational and rational. And a part of what's interesting about magic as a topic of anthropological inquiry is, it, is that it becomes a location for adjudicating the relationship 
between rational and irrational modes of thought. Now, if we zoom out a bit, what is at stake when we're thinking about the relationship between irrationality and rationality? Well, these are related to some other bigger concepts, enchantment and disenchantment, tradition or the primitive and modernity. And so if you look on the side of fake magic, entertainment magic. I'm sorry, I'm using a, a pejorative term for a rhetorical effect. It's not, I don't actually believe that it's fake magic. Um, we're talking about modern Western Euro-American culture. And the real magic is something that, at least from the standpoint of real anthropology, is something that belongs to the rest, the rest of the people in the world who are non-modern, subjects living outside of the kind of Euro-American, the sphere of Euro-American modernity. That's the kind of normative conception of what magic is as an anthropological topic. Um, so, so in my first book, I kind of set that issue aside, partially because I, I couldn't quite figure out how to, con how to make the connection between the anthropology of real magic, or what I refer to in this book as instrumental magic, magic that's done for a ritual purpose, and magic as a mode of entertainment. So my first book mostly focuses on the social life of secret knowledge. It's about how magicians create, circulate, um, and at times destroy secrets as intellectual property but I couldn't quite um, see my way clear of this issue of whether or not this project had, that project had something to do or something to say about magic as an anthropological topic, the way that anthropologists had written on it. And so in Magic's Reason, I return uh, to that issue. Um, and so it's important to say that in that whole tradition of, um, of kind of anthropological writing about instrumental magic, about real magic, anthropologists had almost nothing to say about magic as a mode of entertainment, which is a bit of a surprise given that at the, at the time that anthropology was being created, constructed as a, as a new discipline at the end of the 19th century, uh, was, was the time that magicians themselves refer to as the golden age of modern magic, when magicians were the highest billed and highest grossing entertainers in Europe and North America and throughout many parts of the world. So it's somewhat strange that the magic most prevalent in the societies where anthropologists were emerging would pass without comment, whereas this other form of magic would become such a fixation. And so a part of what I want to do in this book is try to reconcile this paradox. Why would magic be so important in the West and yet totally escape the attention of anthropologists? Um, and so to answer this question, it, it, it's a largely historical question, and it required that I return back to, uh, to the 19th century, to the moment where magic became modern and when anthropology emerged as a discipline. And so the book focuses on two, um, two historical figures, the founding father of modern magic, uh, Jean-Eugène Robéodin, whose um, poster this is on the screen now, um, and, uh, and uh, Tyler, Edward Burnett Tyler, who's the, considered by most people to be the founding father, father of modern uh, anthropology. Now, Roberto Dan was, and not to be confused with Harry Houdini, uh, who was a magician, a couple American magician a few generations later who took Roberto Dan's uh, name as a kind of homage to the, the this kind of um, paternal uh, paternal um, founding father. Um, Robert Dan's claim to be the founding father of mo modern magic reposes largely on this giant book that he wrote, his autobiography, um, 
confidence d'un prestidigitateur, or translated into English, I translate it as a conjurer's confessions, a magician's confessions. And it's a great book. If any of you are fans of um, 19th century French literature or Balzac or Stendhal, it's a, it's a book that can stand up aside, alongside those great um, 19th century novels, a great read. The book ends, um, and it's this kind of protracted argument about why Robert Dan, what, what he did as a magician was so revolutionary and why it represented a decisive break with everything that every magician had done before. Now, obviously that's, that's an artificial construct, a conceit of the book. It's not empirically true, but it's extremely persuasive as a form of, of uh, kind of rhetorical self-fashioning. Not dissimilar from the, from the kind of rhetorical self-fashioning that Tyler engages in in his masterwork, Primitive Culture. Anyway, I'll get to that in a few minutes. The last two chapters of the book are the kind of crowning capstone to um, Robert Dan's mythopoeic self-fashioning as the, the founding father of modern magic. And, and the story that he tells there, which is largely a true story, though I think it contains some elements of fictionalization, was that he was um, sent at the behest of the French colonial army to uh, colonial Algeria for the purpose of disenchanting and debunking um, ritual marvels performed by local indigenous ritual experts. And so in the first, uh, so in the first of these two chapters, he kind of tells the story of his performances. And then in the second chapter, he does a kind of um, blow by blow debunking of things that people have witnessed in Algeria, people, indigenous um, kind of in the context of, of indigenous ritual practices that seem to be magical, but that he purports um, are merely tricks. And that chapter focuses um, entirely on a um, Sufi order called the Asawa. And it, for those of you who know anything about Sufism, the idea of Sufism is that, um, is that you can achieve um, direct contact with divine power through techniques of ecstatic uh, self-transcendence. By going into a state of trance, you can achieve direct connection uh, with divine power. And then through a variety of, of ritual acts, you can communicate that power to, pe to the assembled people around, uh, around a ritual. Now, different and different Sufi orders have different kind of techniques for achieving transcendence and for communicating it. And so the, for the Asawa, um, their um, kind of ritual performance uh, revolves around feats of self-mortification. So um, stabbing themselves with knives, walking on swords, walking on coals. Um, you see here in this picture, which was taken amazingly the same year that Robert Dan was in Algeria, um, one uh, uh, one. Uh, Isawi is about to eat a cactus uh, leaf, uh, and another is touching a red hot plate to his tongue. And so these were the kinds of things that Robert Dan purported to demystify in this chapter uh, of his book called A Lesson on Miracles. Now, the poet Baudelaire later said, only an unbelieving society would send a magician to turn the Arabs from miracles. And this, I think, is very a very astute observation because a part of what's happening, both in Robert Dan's performances and in his representation of those performances, is the assertion of a metaphysical view of the world in which only materialistic cause and effect is real. And so a part of what I argue is that the way that he makes magic modern is by linking it uh, both 
in his performances and in his writing about it to materialistic and naturalistic scientific explanations of how the world works and how it should work. And also representations of people who fall afoul of that kind of prescribed system of belief. Now, one of the things that came as a huge surprise to me uh, as I started looking into this story more deeply is that Robert Dan's representations of the Asawa were just a tiny part of a huge, I, well, maybe I should say rather, they were the tip of a huge iceberg uh, in, uh, of kind of French representations, French depictions, French encounters with the Asawa order. So all tourists who went to Algeria would seek out performances of the Asawa and write about it. Um, and the Asawa were brought on many occasions to Europe to travel and perform, mostly in France, but uh, also, as we will see, in England, in London, in Germany. Um, and so here's a drawing uh, done by, um, oops, here's a drawing uh, done uh, in 1881 in a French Newsweekly, one of hundreds of such drawings uh, that, that I've collected and that I analyze in the book. And a part of what you'll see is that the, the marvels, the kind of um, feats through which the Asawa communicate the kind of state of transcendence of, of normal human conditions are decontextualized from the context of a ritual. This isn't a ritual. This is just a kind of compendium of tricks linked together. And you can compare it to Robert Dan's poster. What this artist has done is taken the visual language of magic where magicians use these little lozenges to depict their marquee tricks. These are the things you've got to see. These are the things that are gonna, gonna fill the theater. People are gonna throng to the theater to see these amazing, amazing tricks. The artist in the image on the left has depicted the Asawa according to that logic. Um, this process of, of assimilation of the Asawa to the kind of um, framework of Western entertainment magic probably reached its apotheosis in 1889 when the Asawa came to perform at the, World, the Parisian World's Fair and then went on to perform in a series of, of magic. They performed in a number of magic theaters in Paris and then in London. So this is a poster uh, for, for that performance. Um, here's a handbill uh, for their 1889 performance in uh, London at St. James Hall. Um, and here's a review. I just found one of the reviews from a newspaper called The Era. And the reviewer describes the performance as several brown-skinned individuals in oriental costume performing with a vast amount of roaring and tomfoolery, tricks which are, uh, most of them, familiar to the patrons of penny shows and country fairs. And so this review is very typical of some of the kinds of reactions that the Asawa elicited uh, in their travels in Europe, where clearly the reviewer is comparing them to magicians and saying, okay, the, this is a kind of trick. They're trying to make us think this is real, but we're smart enough to know that it's not. We know that this is facetious. We can see right through it. And so what's important is that magic here, the trick, becomes a test. Are you too gullible? Are you gullible enough to be persuaded that it's real? Or are you smart enough to, to discern that it's fake? So magic here to, emerges as this kind of litmus test, or a kind of intelligence test, as it were. Now, it's not to kind of zoom out a bit and contextualize culturally the space in which this was happening. At the same moment, uh, there was a huge sensation uh, in the UK, especially in, in, in England and in, in the US, for um, spiritualist performers who were, who were 
applying these same theaters, performing in these same theatrical spaces, and purporting to have um, supernatural, magical powers and magical abilities in particular to communicate with deceased spirits or with disembodied spirits. And so this was a huge controversy uh, in Victorian England, whether or not um, this was real, is this a new form of religion? Is this uh, kind of heralding a new era of scientific discovery where we can penetrate into the realm of the great beyond? Or is this all just a trick? Is it charlatanism? Is it just a kind of unhealthy excrescence of stage magic that is, that's been taken to some kind of um, perverse space of charlatanism. And one of the people who became deeply embroiled in this controversy was none other than Tyler, uh, the founding father of, of, um, of modern anthropology, really. And Tyler, uh, the only field work he ever did was several weeks spent in London observing spiritualist mediums and their clients. Uh, and Tyler concluded that it was, it was all a trick. It was all tricks. Um, and that was really what he was trying to do, just figure out is it real or is it not? And this is why this was so important to Tyler. Um, because one of the key issues in primitive culture is, is a story, a teleological story that Tyler wants to tell about the direction and progress of human cultural evolution. Uh, and he wants to, so if we think about, if we go back to this three-cornered concept, magic, science, and religion, what Tyler wants to argue is that primitive human beings have a magical worldview and modern human beings have a scientific worldview and that religion is somewhere in between. So there's this kind of logical progression from magic to religion to science. And ideally, each successive stage should displace the former stage. And so he describes magical beliefs as one of the most pernicious delusions that ever vexed mankind, belonging to the lowest known stages of civilization and to the lower races. So he had a real problem if he's purporting this to be the case at a moment where millions of people uh, in the most modern place, the supposedly most modern places in the world believed in spiritualism, believed in something that he classified uh, as magic. And so the way that he reconciled, a part of the way that he reconciled this problem, this paradox, was by saying, well, it's a trick. They've been tricked. They've been duped. Um, it's a, it's a, a kind of deviant form of belief, but it's an aberration, right? It's an aberrant departure from the teleological arc that he wanted to describe. Now, this brings us to analogy, the issue of analogy. What I want to argue is that in focusing on trickery and the pernicious effects, well, the potentially pernicious effects of a trick when people aren't able to discern that it's fake, Tyler is creating an analogical relationship between something that he knows, uh, modern fake magic, and something that is maybe more unknown, real primitive magic. And as with any analogy, you map structures and patterns from a domain that's known to a domain that you're trying to understand. And in the process, you produce a concept, uh, magic as an anthropological problem, magic as it relates to science and as it relates to religion. Now, when you do this, when you kind of generate concepts through reasoning by analogy, your concept also reflects back on the source, the domain from which you're sourcing ideas. And so there's a kind of dynamism, a dynamic relation between the source, the target, and the concept. And that dynamic relation 
I would argue, is a relationship through which culture is produced. Uh, Marilyn Strathern famously said that culture consists in the way that people draw analogies between different domains of their worlds. And so what I think is interesting in this uh, analogical relationship that I'm pointing to is that this analogy between different forms of magic is being used by magicians like Robert Dan and by anthropologists like Tyler to construct an idea of what it means to be modern and what it means to not be modern by, by contrast. So to go back to the, the first thing I said about the taking play seriously, a part of what I wanna show in this book is that even though magic as a form of entertainment might, be, might have been seen in the eyes of anthropologists as fake and not real and not worthy of anthropological attention, nevertheless, what we have known as anthropologists about magic as a mode of entertainment has seeped in to the ways that we've tried to understand other forms of magic, other forms of magic that uh, are very different. And so uh, one of the things that I show in the book is that once you have a concept, uh, that concept structures, I mean, as an anthropologist, that concept and the analogies embedded within it structure uh, empirical research because those are the resources that you use to pose questions, to ask research questions and to interpret your data. And so this idea of magic as an anthropological problem as it relates to science and religion provided the conceptual foundation for what became a hugely significant lineage of anthropological thinking about magic in which the book that I pointed to by Evans Pritchard is probably one of the kind of most significant steps. And I call this a kind of analogical ladder. And so one of the reasons, uh, as, as I come to an end, one of the reasons why I think it was very hard for me to find my footing on this ladder of analogies when I was looking at entertainment magic is because, um, is because that was folded in, entertainment magic was folded implicitly in to this ladder, but written out of it. It was never an explicit part of the way that this concept was being constructed. Now I wanna end um, by turning, by just because I'm about to hand it over to Katie, I, I wanna look for a moment at uh, her wonderful book, Fortune and the Curse, and, and the Cursed, which is an ethnography of um, Buryat divination in Mongolia. And she has a, you know, so divination as a topic largely fits into this anthropological framework of magic, thinking about magic as it relates to science and religion. Prediction, you know, how do you know what's gonna happen? How do you know what you should do? And she has a, a, a great passage where she talks about Tyler in connection to our problem. And she says, consider Tyler's famous statement, the principal key to the understanding of occult science or magic is to consider it as based on the association of ideas, a faculty which lies at the very foundation of human reason. And she quotes Tyler again, she, he says, magical arts in which, um, in which the connection between things in the world is merely analogy, it's not real. And so she has this great argument in her analysis of divination. I hope, I'm partially I'm saying this because I'm hoping that she'll um, maybe elab elaborate on it, where she says, you know, Tyler is making a mistake by saying that um, when people use magic that involves an analogies, between things that they're trying to understand or trying to control, they're thinking of it only as a mode of explanation. Whereas in reality, the rituals that people perform, the magic that people perform creates, creates connections between things in the world. It creates connections between people. It creates connections between people 
in spirits, between people and objects, between people and animals. So analogy isn't a system of explanation. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of doing things, real things in the world. So I only point that out to show that all of us, you know, as anthropologists who engage in magic in any form are kind of trapped in a way along this ladder. We're dealing with um, concepts not of our making, even if we push back against them and show that they're limited, that they're wrong. We're all, we're nevertheless kind of um, contributing to the extension, the elaboration, the refinement, the precision of concepts like magic. And so I hope that that maybe what I've done in this book, I guess I'll, I'll say by way of conclusion, is um, kind of inserting something that's been um, very marginalized in the tradition of anthropological thinking about magic as a problem, which is magic as a mode of entertainment. Uh, so thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much indeed for that absolutely beautiful uh, presentation, a model of clarity. So, 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 so thank you, thank you so much. Uh, well, over, over to you, Catherine. Yeah, um, thank you so much um, for this wonderful presentation as well. Really, really marvelous. Um, and thank you so much for mentioning my work on, on the side as well. Um, you know, I before actually we, we fully started up today, um, I had had a chance to just briefly chat with, with Graham and, and David and, and Ted and Hanin. And I was saying that, you know, um, it would be wonderful if we could actually do these sessions, Reviewer Meets Reviewed, before actually the reviewer writes the review, because we could then fold that in, um, you know, to the writing of the review itself. Um, and so I really view this session as, as a kind of extension of the review. And, uh, you know, I was jokingly saying as an after party, as it were. Um, and, and what I want to do is, um, I was going to say a little bit about Graham's book just unto itself, but I think he's done such a marvelous presentation already that I'm gonna leap a little bit more towards um, some key points I think that, that I had made in, in my review, assuming maybe not everyone has had the chance to, to read that, but also just as a way of opening up a dialogue of, of a bunch of questions that I have here um, that I'd like to, to field with, with Graham as kind of you know moving towards some thought experiments. Um, While well, at the same time inviting him and, and all of you and the audience um, to jump in at any given point um, so that we can actually open this up to, to a very much bigger and fuller kind of conversation. So um, Graham's book, um, which, which I adore, um, Magic's Reason, um, you know, this is a book that I think really reveals um, the fuller history of magic within the wider history of anthropology. Um, Graham has just been saying moments ago how entertainment ma um, magic and entertainment magicians had been largely kind of silenced within um, anthropology. But actually this book, you know, when I, I read it, I remember getting this feeling that this actually answers many of the questions that I had spring to mind as an undergraduate um, in anthropology. And I, I, I really, um, you know, was, was thrilled to have these kind of questions that I'd almost have forgotten about come to the fore of, of my thinking. And, and just to give you, you know, a few of them um, that I think really sort of evokes what this book is about. One was, you know, well, what's really so different about circus magic and for example, Kula magic um, in Malinowski's, you know, seminal work, Argonauts of the Western Pacific. You know, if in, in both cases, um, entertainment magic and when I'm talking about Kula magic here, I'm talking about the kind of magic that underpins the artistic and technical virtuosity that went into the creation of the canoe prow boards that are painted so beautifully um, that if I were going on an expedition for the Kula and I came ashore and you were standing on that shore and you saw that canoe prow board, you'd be so overwhelmed by it that you might, um, without even meaning to agree to trade me your most precious kind of Kula items. You know, what's so different between those two kinds of magic if both are designed to overwhelm audiences with feats that seem to be entirely summoned by the magician's powers? 
And another kind of question is, you know, how do we actually know that stage magicians are not summoning the spirits to help them perform their acts? This, in fact, was a question um, that came up quite often in the 19th century. Graham was talking about that with the example of the Davenport brothers, and that was right there in the midst of early, the early anthropological milieu, and it was something that drove um, E.B. Tyler a little bit, a little bit crazy at times to think about, you know. Um, here's another kind of question, you know, how is it that stage magic did not make a bigger splash in the history of anthropology, given that so many pages have been written about spells and logic, technical mastery and rationality, so to speak, you know, belief and skepticism, or even the choice to ask for the help of spirits and gods rather than to rely solely on one's own skills. So Graham, um, he said himself, and for those of you that have had the chance to read the book, and for those of you who haven't, but I'm sure after this session today will want to, um, he wrote his first book, Trade of the Tricks, that was published in 2011 by University of California Press, and that's an ethnography of French magicos, or these illusionists, um, you know, they're contemporary magicians, and they often envision their craft as being somehow inspired by early anthropological works on magic. So they are reading early anthropology books, they're conversant with it. Um, it's not at all a novelty to them. They can sit down and maybe take you point by point through some of, some of Tyler's stuff, perhaps, or Fraser's stuff. Um, and their approach to magic, I find this so interesting, was intriguing enough to Graham, you know, as an anthropologist, as a field worker, that he decided to address these kinds of questions that I was just tossing a few examples out um, moments ago that might seem familiar to some of us from undergraduate days. Um, and they were provoked these questions by French magicos in, in dialogue with Graham. This, this sort of provoked him to, um, you know, have that become the basis for this current book we're talking about today, um, Graham's second book, Magic Reason, Magic's Reason rather. Um, and this kind of, you know, the French magicos vocation, it gives us pause for rethinking the wider role of magic in the making of modern anthropology. So what we see when we look at Graham's book is that professional performance artists, um, like illusionists, like members of the spiritualist movement, other kinds of magicians, his craft was not necessarily staged as a performance art, um, maybe like the Asawa, for example, but also early anthropologists, they were all part of a single historical moment and it made anthropology what it became today. So as I mentioned in my review, Graham shows that illusionists and anthropologists share an intellectual heritage that's built on the analogies that they've jointly crafted between so-called primitive magic that ostensibly accomplishes genuinely extraordinary feats and uh, you know, modern performance magic that invites spectators to uncover the techniques for clever tricks is at least kind of staged in this way. Hey, I have a wonderful clever trick and, 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 and you're having the entertained moment of watching me sort of um, hide it behind a screen over here. You know that there's something behind that trick and it, it in fact invites you to guess what that can be, but I'm not gonna show you directly myself almost as though you're watching a murder mystery television show or something. So this really means that for, for, for wider anthropology, one huge um, contribution and merit of this book is to get us to look at our own discipline because the full cast in anthropology's early days of anthropology included magicians is much larger than we would think. It has Euro-American magicos self-styled as rational and reflexive illusionists. It has members of the spiritualist movement who presented their seances as genuine magical contact with spirits. It had these Algerian Asawa entertainment magicians whose feats of bodily mortification in European performance context, um, they were either rejected as illusionary tricks or some audience members actually accepted them as genuine magic, but they were enabled by spirits and the devil. He had novel acts like the Davenport brothers. They blended techniques of illusionists and spiritualists to capitalize on the uncertainty surrounding which, if any particular act, could actually showcase genuine magic in the first place. You had early anthropologists who were uncomfortable with the studies of, that their own studies of primitive magic from across the globe might resonate with the beliefs of, of their own peers and spiritualist encounters, thereby upsetting the social evolutionary assumption that enlightened Euro-American rationalists are at the pinnacle of the world's civilizations. And then you had audiences and members of the general public. And I think this is so interesting. I wish, I wish we had an ethnography from those days that somebody did amongst the audience members because these people were eagerly consuming the works 
of these rival performers, magicians, and scholars. And actually, you know, this was sort of the, the, the public verdict on, on what this was all about was something that really swayed um, the thoughts. And I think the performative approaches, not just of the illusionists and the magicos and the spiritualists and people like the Davenport brothers, but people like E.B. Tyler, for example. So revealingly, each of these kinds of categories of persons mobilized what Graham calls, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking a nice uh, uh, choice quote from his book on page seven, a representational feedback loop linking the entertainment industry and anthropological scholarship in parallel efforts to define magic. You know, what is magic in the first place? So here what we have is we have a model of concept building that's grounded in recursive dialectics. And anthropological distinctions between primitive and modern, rational or irrational, enchanted versus disenchanted, and so forth, these kinds of things, they operate in ways that pit any given analogy against its disanalogy, so Graham is arguing, for the purposes of contrastive comparison. And we've 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 seen this already in this wonderful slideshow presentation where Graham is showing that com contrastive comparisons climb an analogical ladder such that anthropological theories are always initially rooted in concepts and they do not necessarily arise, um, as he says in the book, from an ethnographic case per se. So they might do, but they don't, they don't absolutely have to do so. And he takes this further when suggesting that analogical ladders are the products of an ethnohistorically reflexive theoretical development that feeds past histories of concepts shaped as they are by illusionists, other performers, anthropologists and their audiences. This is all being um, you know, fed into current theory making processes, not just in early anthropology days, but even still now, because it's our legacy, it's our heritage. So one might argue, and I will come back to this, that this ethno-historically reflexive theoretical development is built upon a kind of ethnography, even if we don't have one written, um, from the 19th century, but, but these kinds of dynamics are, are perhaps still at play. Um, and this ethno-historical information um, that we have now in Graham's book on illusionist anthropologists and their audiences, and I'm talking the, the, the historical stuff from the 19th century, it's one kind of avenue for us to look back at and, and think of an alternative history of anthropology and by, by virtue of that, an alternative anthropology to what we might think um, we have today. Um, so what I want to do for the moment, though, is stick a bit more closely, um, just for a few more moments, to Graham's sense of ethno-historically reflexive development in which we anthropologists are the inheritors, not only of an anthropological heritage, but of diverse magician and stage performance lineages, too. Uh, we've all heard of Latour's famous book, We've Never Been Modern. Uh, we need another one that says we've always been magicians or something in anthropology, you know? So, in, in, in my review, um, I kind of suggested that this model of theory making might be most aptly presented not as a kind of stepwise ladder, um, it, the, this wonderful image that, that Graham showed us on the slides moments before, but in the form of a spiral that could more closely capture what Graham calls the dynamic of inter-illumination, um, a beautiful quote from page 159, this is this dynamic of inter-illumination that anthropologists, their research partners and audiences co-produce through recursive assemblages of concepts and ethnography. Okay, so I said that in my review, um, but as this is a bit the after party, I'm, I'm kind of now wondering about the possibility of having both the stepwise ladder model and the spiral model being possibilities, like anthropological possibilities that we, do, we, we can have multiple modes at once with the view that each are actually specific to their own ethnographic and ethno-historical context. So we know that, that Graham has worked with French magicos who align themselves with the rational uh, quote unquote sense of magic as propounded by early anthropologists. And if I'm correct, uh, I, I think I am from, from, from the presentation we saw today, the magicos subscribe to the idea that they produce illusions with a logical, rational basis to them. And it's their job, of course, to hide this from audiences that want to watch and be entertained as though they're seeing the seemingly impossible unfold before them. And that's really quite interesting. Audiences already coming with an expectation that they're seeing the seemingly impossible. And mind you, this would be um, many within the 19th century year American audiences, but not all of them. We have to remember back to the example of those who are watching the Algerian Esawa 
uh, entertainment magicians and saying, wow, this is actually, these are real tricks done by spirits of the devil, for example. So, you know, there's, there are ambiguities at play and, and different viewpoints onto it, of course, you get different people with different experiences, having different takes on any given performance that they see. Now, anthropological and ethno-historical concepts that are built upon this kind of Euro-American model of rationality is so familiar to us from our own disciplinary history. These do actually, I think, fit with and seem to climb a stepwise ladder, the one like that Graham was telling to us, in line with what Euro-American ontologies, you know, modes of being, um, were like in the 19th century and, and certainly still seem to be in a general sense like today. We do have the New Age movement, we do have lots of other elements to our wider society, but there's certainly a very dominant strain um, that, that does, does tend to think, as Graham is saying, teleologically, linearly progression through time from A to B, and, 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 and that is sort of a one track sort of direction that we get quite often in the ways in which time and causality are both envisioned. So um, this model of teleological linear progress through time is familiar, but it's also very ethnographically and ethnohistorically apt if we are talking about a Euro American setting. And by contrast, um, as Graham was so kind as to have, have mentioned anyhow, um, uh, some of the work that I've done, this spiral model of time, but also of concept building, it complements many peoples across Asia. Um, it certainly works for, I think, for the Buryats of Northeast Mongolia uh, and China, where I did my, my first work, but also more recently been working with a tibeto burman group known as the Nulsu in Southwest China. It also works there. Um, and both of these groups actually have their own ethno historians. And among the Nongsu in, in particular, who I've worked very more specifically with their ethno historians, they've been my kind of routine field work partners. Um, you know, they, they also tend to envision cause and effect in a spiral kind of way. And what do I mean by a spiral? Because we can think of sort of a circle where we start at one point and we go around and we reach the same point. And in some ways, actually, the, the lovely slides that Graham gave about the analogy itself, it was a triangle, but it kind of was a, it, you know, you could see it as a closed circuit. I'm talking about something a little bit different to that. So what happens is when you move along this, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm using my hands and my gestures as though I'm a, a, a magico here. Now I didn't make, make, make an image otherwise, um, but I'm, I'm talking about something whereby you, you have it be the case that people as they're living their lives, they seem to come back in a cyclical mode of time-like fashion to a point where they were before, but it's of course not exactly the very same point. There's a, a variation on a theme as it were. And so their experience moving through time is spiral-like. So you have recursivity, you have echoes of the past, um, you have resonances with what came before. And in this sense, it, it's a bit almost, um, if, we, if we think about, you know, for example, Mercia Eliot's uh, classic work on cosmogonies, you know, uh, rituals like the New Year's that bring us to um, celebrate a moment in time that this is 2022, uh, the New Year for us has just passed, or if we're looking at the Lunar New Year, it's, it's coming up soon around the 1st of February. It's not the same as 2021, or at least we all hope not. I hope it will be better um, in terms of COVID-19 and everything else, right? But we, we are having um, you know, a New Year's festivity that happens roughly around the same time each year, but it does, so in that sense, it's cyclical, but it's still not the exact, exact same event, it's a year later. So this kind of um, model is, is something we can see in terms of time, it's quite obvious and easy to talk about them, but we can also see it in terms of cause and effect. Um, and I, I, I don't want to sort of go too much into the detail of that ethnography just now, I'm, I'm quite happy to do so if it comes out in the discussion, but to kind of stick with the conceptual kind of hooks here that I, I want to bring into focus in dialogue with, with Graham's work. Um, I want to, I just wanted to say that the spiral model was something I'd said in my review to, to Graham's book. Hey, wouldn't this be, you know, the way forward? Isn't this the way to think of anthropology? Isn't the stepwise ladder like um, inadvertently evoking evolutionary ways of thinking? Um, and, you know, the, the, the perhaps one unspoken thread within that was, is this where we want anthropology to be? Well, for many of us, the, the answer is maybe, maybe, maybe not, but that's also because we're, we tend to think through the lens of our ethnographic glasses. So for me, I would be trying to showcase 
you know, the, the worlds that people are living in in their greatest diverse kind of sense in anthropology. And I'm drawing on worlds that are really quite different to what we find in Euro-America. But I suppose what we could do if we wanted is to, again, as a thought experiment kind of, um, in that sense of the term, is actually see these as different possible models. Um, and without trying to sort of get to uh, Philip, uh, Philip Descolian about it and saying there's one kind of mass way of approaching ontology here versus there versus the next. We have the naturalistic model, you know, we have um, the animistic model, we have the analogical model and so on and so forth. But to actually be even more pluralistic than that, because of course we may find ontologies that don't so neatly fit into something like Descolian's framework. And this has been discussed very much in those sorts of corners of anthropology. And yeah, we have many kinds of exceptions to the rule. Um, but it's quite interesting to think in terms of how concepts might be built through these ethnic histories. So what I want to do now is actually shift um, my discussion towards some questions for Graham and, and a dialogue with him in the spirit of unpacking a kind of bigger question about how many different modes of ethnic historically reflexive theoretical development, and by virtue of this, how many different anthropologies might we envision being out there in our discipline today, even if we're not envisioning it out there like in the wider world, but I think we can do that too, but certainly at least within anthropology itself. So if I can maybe put my first specific question to, to Graham besides that kind of general question, it's, it's to ask you, Graham, you know, what do you make of this spiral versus stepwise ladder kind of you know, models, this little, little mini debate that we've had. And do you think that one captures the sense of what's happening better in anthropology at large than the other? Or you know, might you suggest um, working with both? <clears throat> wow, thank, thank you so much for that, Katie. There's, there's, there's so many um, amazing things packed into um, what you've just said, and, and I want uh, to address that question, but there are a few other things <laughs> before that I might just pick up on en route to addressing that question. So one of the, the things that, I mean, you, you phrased this rather pointedly about alternate, writing an alternative history of anthropology. And so I want to go back to what you said about French magicos being attuned to anthropological representations of magic. I don't want to give the false impression that all, all the magicians <laughs> that I met with are reading Lévi-Strauss. No, it was a, a few people um, who would, you know, bring up, uh, bring up, um, uh, Levi Strauss or Marcel Mauss or some of these classic anthropological works with me, but by no means everybody. Nevertheless, I think many magicians had in their back, in the back of their mind, some idea about primitive magic that was invariably rooted in imagery promulgated by magician. I mean, by anthropologists that's kind of seeped into the, the kind of broader intellectual milieu. But I, I want to say something about why that kind of imagery and why those kind of texts are so appealing uh, to, the, to those magicians who choose to kind of gravitate towards it and engage with it. Because I think it says something about just as we as anthropologists might want to write an alternative history of anthropology, they as magicians are also very interested in writing an alternative history of magic. And the reasons I think are complementary. You described in beautiful terms, the kind of conventions associated with magic where, where the, kind of paradoxically, a performance is presented as an intellectual puzzle. You know, you, we're gonna show you something impossible, but you know that it's actually possible and your job is to be entertained, but also, but nevertheless, um, nevertheless, not taken in. Not if if you think it's real, you haven't been a successful spectator. You're supposed to know that. You're supposed to struggle to explain and then not be able to. That's when everybody has done their job in the right way. 
But for a lot of magicians, that's unsatisfying. They want to do more than just present a puzzle, just present a challenge. They want their performances to mean something, to say something, to communicate kind of spiritually, metaphysically, um, poetically, artistically with people. And so what models do they look towards? They look towards rituals and they look towards the rituals of magicians whose perform uh, kind of real magicians, whose performances affect change in people's lives because they speak to deeply held personal concerns and convictions. And so for them, the interest in the anthropology of magic is in many ways born of a frustration with the conventional limitations of the genre in which they're working. And so I think that you're also pointing to, I mean, in the, in the kind of diagrams that I produced in the book and that I showed in, in the slideshow, I think I, I tried to, I, I admit that they're very reductionist. And, you know, I wanted to, to call attention to the way the anthropologists use middle range theory in building case studies. But obviously it's reductionistic because you know, in, in, your, in your book, for instance, you draw on a myriad intellectual sources. It's not just, okay, this is a contribution to the anthropology of magic. It's a contribution to the anthropology of Mongolia. It's a contribution to the anthropology of post-socialism. So already there, there are a huge number of relationships, intertextual, conceptual, that kind of fan out from any ethnography and that kind of are, um, that dovetail in, in the writing of a text. Um, so it's, it's a reductionistic image, but I couldn't figure out how to draw it otherwise. I tried fractals. I, I wanted to get to the spiral. Um, but I think what, what is the spot when we're, when we're working, to, so I'm, I'm getting to the spiral. When we're reaching for an alternative history of anthropology, but also an alternative kind of epistemology, an alternative methodology, I think we're also chafing often against the constraints of ethnography as a genre as we've, inhab as we've inherited it and as, kind of as it takes shape in the history that, that I've described, I think, where, um, where the, the kind of motivating impetus for any ethnographic writing is this kind of intellectual puzzle that's often premised on epistemic alterity. These people are totally different from me. They believe something totally different. And my job is to explain it, to show how it's possible for them to believe something that's so different or for them to do something that's so different than what people in the society that I come from do. And I think that many of us, you know, chafe against that premise of alterity. And we want to find ways to write more reflexively, to engage um, 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 kind of more inter intimately in intersubjective relationships with the people we write about and break down that premise of alterity. But it's hard to get away from it because I think we're trapped in the model of the latter. We're trapped in this linear model. And so in that sense, I, I love the idea of the spiral. I'm, I'm, not quite, I'm not quite sure how to visualize what it, what it means in practice. And maybe, maybe you could, I mean, you asked this question, how many different modes of of ethno-historical theoretical development are there. Maybe I could put this back to you so that you could tell us a bit more about what the spiral model might look like. Because I will say that in my case, I think I'm, I was in a very unique position where as an anthropologist of Europe, as a Europeanist anthropologist, there is a kind of um, kind of the cultural mil the cultural object that I'm studying, entertainment magic, 
is it coexists with a body of scholarly literature that speaks to it intertextually. And so it's possible to engage in a kind of ethno-historically reflexive um, um, cultural history in which the intellectual history of anthropology is folded in to the cultural history of magic or vice versa. I mean, maybe more vice versa is what I'm doing, folding the cultural history of magic into the intellectual history of anthropology as a discipline. But I think that that seemed to me, you know, and this is the kind of thing, Michael Hertzfeld does this too. It seemed to me when I was writing that, that it wouldn't necessarily be something so easy to do if you were studying a context where there wasn't a kind of um, kind of independent and sui generis uh, social scientific kind of community or practice coexisting with the, the thing that you're studying. So I don't know how that looks in, in China, say. Yeah, no, <clears throat> this is a great question. I mean, the, the spiral, when I put that forth for the brilliant Mongols, I was there looking at cases of things like fallen fortune, how to make it rise again, curse episodes, um, how to find tailor-made innovative ways of working around problems through cause and effect. And, and this model was helpful for cases where people were looking at a cumulative effect over time of many causes that sort of reach up to a single effect, but it changes where your standing is when say, for example, you've produced a new kind of innovative, innovative remedy. You, you, you tried all the conventional ones, they failed. You made something new and hey, that got rid of, for example, a bunch of curses that were causing you to, to not perform well in your work, causing illness and all kinds of things. But then, you know, it doesn't take much longer for a neighbor who's um, a little bit jealous or upset with you or something to toss another problem your way. And you go out and you try everything conventional again and it still doesn't work. And therefore you seek out another tailor-made kind of remedy. And, and so, the course of events um, spirals, um, and also it's a cumulative kind of mode of causation, how it is envisioned there. But if I just transpose this now to kind of address your question more specifically with where you might have, you know, an ethno-historical kind of um, practice, but that is maybe not exactly like what, what we would think through, um, I can give that to you with my cases in Southwest China with the Nusu, this tibeto burman group. So, the Nulsu have a very interesting history. I can't go into all the details here, um, but one thing about them is they really like to ethno-historically trace their own um, culture and society and also the influences they've had on other groups across Asia and in particularly the Han ethnic majority of China. They like to trace this back to 4,000 years or plus of, of history. We're going all the way back to the Bronze Age here. Um, and when they do this, they also do it in a way that you could think of in terms of looking at cumulative cause and effect. So for example, um, they like to claim that they, they have produced the origins of just about anything under the sun. Binary mathematics as invented by Leibniz, um, how computer programs work, there is an origin with this somewhere in Nunsu ethnic history, cosmology, and so on and so forth. So, really super duper grand claims like this. And when you're looking at this kind of, you know, epistemology and, and, and actually because it's really something that, that is being popularized. So it's filtering into everyday um, practice just, just in the way that, for example, some of the magic has maybe not all, but some have read, you know, early anthropology. So we're also having this scholarship being read and picked up by, by just popular people throughout society. This means that it's starting to become kind of really a thing at the ontological level in terms of <laughs> modes of being. It's not just epistemology, it's not just cosmology. You know, we really can trace our origins back um, to the ancient kingdom of Shu on the Chengdu plain. And we really were the descendants of thus and such, a Bronze Age society. And we really um, are, you know, the older brothers, the sort of senior partners to to even, even the ethnic majority within China. So very extremely grand claims. And this is not just something that people like say or mention or whisper, 
Um, I don't have it, it next to me in any way. It's written in, in Chinese, but publications um, that are coming out by some of these ethnic historians that are basically saying that the Dao de Jing all came from them. So that when you look at this kind of thing and you say, what's going on here? Their view of cause and effect, which is built on a certain kind of practice of ethnic history um, becomes much more spiral-like. But what's interesting here, the, the, the big difference, and this is why I've been a little bit rethinking the stepwise um, ladder that you've talked about, because I think it really does fit um, not the cases maybe I'm talking about, but the cases you're talking about. Because if we go back to your slides from today's presentation with uh, so-called real magic versus fake magic, um, we're starting off already with this binary parsing out of types and typologies. I mean, that's so classic in, 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 in sort of your American thinking anyway, isn't it? Think in terms of binary. So don't put your eggs on one basket, don't spiral it, but parse them out and separate it. And then we can go up this sort of more linear um, stepwise ladder, which is what had made me think that actually um, more than one of these is ethnographically <clears throat> possible. But I, I also wanted to ask a little bit about your your use of your, your discussion of um, concepts leading to concepts um, and leaving off out of the equation necessary there doesn't have to be there eth ethnographic examples that we can just go from one concept to the to the next um, that you're saying that like the stepwise ladder can work like this it works more on concepts rather than on ethnographic cases per se um, and actually the thing is can we separate the two? I mean, if our concepts are coming out of our ethnography, you know, um, what's so interesting in your case is there seems, there seems to be something of an ellipse here. Um, and that is precisely because anthropology has been kind of like denying or silencing, um, perhaps, you know, this, this, this whole portion that is parsed away, um, which I guess is the, um, the, the fake magic, was that the fake magic, the term you're using, the one that the stage magicians do, performance illusionist magic, having that drop aside. And therefore it also gives us, talk about a major illusion here. It gives us the feeling that it's coming only out of ethnic history, but no ethnographic examples. But of course your book itself is filling that very gap. Um, we've, we've forgotten about it. We've let that heritage fall out of our heads. We've always been magicians, um, but we think that we've never been magicians, you know? Um, and that is actually a part of our intellectual legacy here. Um, and so that's really something I think provocative to anthropology at large and really important. And what I kind of like about it is on the one hand, it reminds us, um, you know, really truly what our discipline originally was about. And that was maybe not the kind of parsing of modes of magic that would be my favorite or your favorite or a lot of people's favorites, but it's there. We need to know it's there. We teach about it. We, we keep aware of it and abreast of it. Um, but at the same time, it also reminds us about the other side of that, that maybe is more kind of attuned to, like when you're saying these magicians want to um, hone their craft, not just like I want to become a better magician for myself, but I actually want to change the genre as we move across time. We want it to maybe have an emotional kind of effect on people. We want it to have something that is like what, what the rituals and the old magic sort of stuff that we read about in, in Marcel Mauss or Claude levi strauss or something like that does. Um, they actually want to mold and shape their discipline like that. Well, well so do we as anthropologists. And, and frankly, any great kind of art form or discipline tends to, you know, pivot around this. Um, so how, you know, how is it that maybe, maybe if I come back to you with another kind of related question, I, I, have, I have many more here that I also wanna pursue, but just quickly on this note, um, you know, how is it do you think that your book could tell readers, show them not just what has happened historically, but give us a kind of foresight uh, we'll let you be a magician predict and control it for us now, you know, into seeing like anthropology in a much fuller kind of sense. And not just that we had this, this big cast of magicos from the past there, but how does it get us to see the future of anthropology in a different light? What, what is it that we really should take away from this in terms of recrafting our own field? Um, because we all kind of want to do it. It's, it's fun, yeah. it's theory making, but it's not just that, it's more than that. It's actually a bigger kind of picture, um, which is what, what is the discipline's direction that we want to, to see happen? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great question and a timely 
question, you know, a, around shortly after, you know, this, this book came out, there was the American Anthropological Association has the, in their flagship journal, uh, American Anthropologist, they have a year in review section. And I don't know if it was a year or two after this came out that the cultural anthropology year in the review, the title of it was the case for letting anthropology burn. You know, and I do think that there, there are certain, there are many, I mean, there's a, one of the things that's exhausting about being an anthropologist, at least of our generation, but I think maybe a generation or two before us too, and probably the generation after us, um, is that the discipline feels like it's in a perpetual state of crisis, a perpetual state of, you know, how do we, you know, I think that anthropology is probably much more preoccupied with exercising its historical demons than other social sciences. Um, perhaps because of the, the colonial legacy of the discipline and the role that the discipline has played um, in colonial projects, and then the fact that our work continues in post-colonial spaces. So I, I feel like um, our discipline is, I don't wanna say plagued because it might be a healthy thing, but that there's a, a, a kind of sense of perpetual crisis in a, a crisis of identity, crisis of commitment, crisis of, of, um, of meaning that, that so many of us just work with as a baseline condition. Um, I, I talked to someone recently who actually left the profession of anthropology and, and became a his, went to work in history because they said it was too exhausting. This is the, the cry, they wanted to be at a discipline that wasn't in a state of perpetual crisis. Um, so, so what was I saying? Oh yeah, so what do, what, what do I think that we should take away from this? Well, I don't, I don't know, but I think it's very helpful what you've teased out uh, of, of, the, of the book is, is that to show that the way that I've thought about anthropology, I mean, I think that I kind of um, wanted to expand upon the way that some of the aporias or blind spots in the way that the discipline has thought about one of its kind of really pivotal concepts kind of can help us think about, can help illuminate the condition of crisis into which we've worked ourselves. Um, and I'm not quite sure if I have the idea, nor am I able to prognosticate about how we can work ourselves out of that crisis. But I do think that what you're saying is very provocative, that maybe the way that I've depicted how anthropology works, while it may be kind of ethnographically, an ethnographically accurate representation of the way that many of us as practicing anthropologists think about how we build knowledge within certain lineages of ideas um, might uh, be just one way of working, one way of working among other possibilities. Uh, and maybe the model of a spiral or other types of images, maybe we need other kinds of images that allow us to continue to do the work of, of building knowledge and contributing to knowledge, because I, I think it's important. I don't want us to stop doing that, but maybe we need other models that allow us to do it just as magicians often are looking for other models that allow them to continue on with the work that they value, but in, an, in a way that gives them access to the dimensions that they feel cut off from. Yeah. And maybe the, maybe the picture of the spiral 
I, I've, I've drawn it. I don't know if that's what it looks like in your mind's eye, um, but maybe this type of imagery uh, can help unlock a, a different way of approaching mm. really theory. Really the question is theory. What is the role of theory in anthropology? Yeah. And maybe you're pointing to a different way of, of engaging in theory building. This is a fascinating discussion and I certainly don't want to impede it in any way, but we do always promise we also allow people to talk from the floor. Yes. Um, so so uh, please, uh, please, please colleagues, um, uh, go, go ahead if you, if, if you, if you, if you have a question. Uh, continuing this train of thought, does anthropology need theory? I think was the question or, or any other that you find stimulated by this magical discussion. Uh, David, there is uh, four raised hands also in the audience, so we could just splendid. work, splendid. We well, let, just let, work let, through let, let, them. Um, let, so, let's go through these raised hands. I see, great. Well, Meg, let's just go down the, the list in order then. Um, so first one up is, 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 is David Zeitlin. Um, so go ahead, David. Let me unmute myself. Um, okay, um, really interesting discussion and Granted what has just been said, I'm going to plug um, my book, which is going to be forthcoming in Berghahn the end of this year, which has a very different view of anthropological theory, which is basically as piecemeal, as mosaic, as a jumble, a heterogeneous jumble. Um, the way I see it is basically as uh, a recipe book, ingredients for making anthropology soup. Um, but the reason I originally raised my hand was to make two different points. One is a 19th century parallel, which hasn't been evoked, which relates to Luke Boltanski's book, uh, Mysteries and, oh God, what's it called? Mysteries and Conspiracies. So he points out that contemporary, with, uh, with Durkheim, contemporary with Tyler, was the development of the detective story, the development of the spy story, where the whole conceit is that there is a mystery and someone, i.e. a researcher, can reveal what is hidden. And then, of course, there, through a chain of um, Arthur Conan Doyle going to spiritualist seances, we actually connect up with your topic. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave that one floating and mention that Linda Woodhead, who works on contemporary New Age religion, has done work with... Um, diviners and diviners as entertainers oh. so at a hen party you might have someone who does tarot readings and on her account what happens is people go into the other room with the diviner it's all very jokey fun it's entertainment and then sometimes not always but sometimes it flips and it suddenly gets serious. And this might match um, kind of with this kind of switching from a stepladder into a spiral. It doesn't have to be one thing or another. People kind of jump. And I mean, I loved uh, Katie's idea of the ethnography of the audiences in 19th century, I mean, but this exactly exemplifies, unfortunately, a contemporary one, but that I, I mean, the Conan Doyle and the controversies he got into is the nearest I know of, of a 19th century ethnography. I'll, I'll let other people speak. Thank you very much. And a great seminar. Well, well, Graham, would you like to, to answer David's, David's question? Well, I think those are all fantastic connections and I, I've I've written them down. It's a, it's great to meet David because I, he's done so much important work on divination, but also on the relationship between anthropology and history. So um, thank you so much for coming and, and thank you for these invaluable um, um, remarks. I think that this issue about the way things can switch and flip 
and change categories um, is really interesting because, and this kind of goes back, I think, to maybe what Katie was saying at the at the very beginning about um, kind of um, kind of tacitly invoking uh, Alfred Gell and thinking about technologies of enchantment. That there's a certain kind of kind of volatility and unpredictability um, when you're kind of releasing these these energies um and so it, it it is really i think it's really important to not only uh and this also points to one of the limitations of of the material that we might have to work with to not only think of the multiplicity of possible interpretations across participants within any given event or situation, but the multiplicity of possible interpretations within the perspective of individual participants over time, over the course of events. And I think, I mean, you know, David Lewis uh, wrote a beautiful piece about this, about, you know, how these kind of conflicting and competing frames can coexist in the con in the context of a shamanic performance, both for different audience members, but in the in the same perspective of an individual audience member. So all that I think goes, I mean, speaks to the importance of really striving for nuanced detail in any attempt to ethnographically account for what goes on in a situation like this where kind of powerful um, stimuli are provoking uh, kind of sensory and intellectual effective kind of occasions for interpretation and engagement. Really interesting. Well, well, well th thank you very, very, very much indeed. Let, let's carry on with the questions for, 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 for now. Um, and the next on the list is, is, is Lola, um, Martinez, are you here, Lola? Can you please go ahead? Just unmuting. Can you hear me now? Hi. Absolutely, absolutely. Hi. Good afternoon to you. Uh, great to meet you, Graham. I've been I've been trying to convince people here in Oxford you should come and talk to us in a seminar. Maybe maybe David and I can twist their arms a bit. Um, you know, I was so grateful to to Katie when she offered to review your book, and I went out and got myself a copy immediately afterwards. But I, I wanted to make two. Um, comments. I'm not sure if they're questions. One has to do with kind of models and anthropology as an example. And, and one of the reasons I enjoyed your book so greatly was because it kind of satisfied a question I'd had ever since I'd read Tanya Lorman's The Persuasions of a Witch's Craft, where she ends by saying, but how can these people who are computer scientists and scientists working in labs believe in magic at the same time. And she, she really can't get her mind around this as an anthropologist and she can't create any sort of way of getting out of that box. And there was a kind of answer by um, someone from the witch community who was so angered by this. She became an anthropologist and wrote a book called Susan Greenway. I'm not sure she answered the question, but it was just interesting that when, we, you know, we're, we're also looking at people able to respond to the anthropologist gaze in some point. And, and we need to kind of keep that in mind and maybe work it into our models more completely. And, and my other observation had to do with models. A long time ago, when I was an undergraduate just doing anthropology, I worked as a guide at the Museum of Science and Industry. And I was there in, in Chicago in 76. We had some Russians over because we were making peace with the Russians. And um, the, they brought an anthropologist along as well as all their engineers and things. And so the anthropologist found out I was doing anthropology at the U of C at that point. And, and he said to me, well, do you want to know how societies work? Um, we weren't just supposed to talk to them, but we did talk to them uh, without their minders, I mean. And he drew a spiral. And he said, this is how societies work. People go along, go along. They think everything's the same and nothing's changing, but things are changing all along the way. And by the time you get to the bottom, you're in a different place historically than you were when you started. But nobody has stopped to think 
about the changes along the way because they just take them for granted. And so they, you think you're in the same place because you can draw a straight line down, but actually you've done a lot of changing along the way. And as you were having this discussion with Katie, I, I remembered that and I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just tell you that there was a Russian anthropologist at once upon a time who was thinking in spirals. Anyway, thank you very much for for your um, your discussion today, and maybe we'll get you here to talk to us in Oxford at some point. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank so. you. Go ahead, Graham. Mm. Katie, do you want do you want to say anything? Um, uh, wonderful comment. I'll just say very briefly. Um, the first trip I ever did to Russia. I actually met sort of a regular family and just say, oh, hello, how are you? Um, and what do you do? Oh, I study anthropology. I was visiting their house. Oh, really? And suddenly they take down off their shelf. This is a gift for you. And it's Levi Strauss's structural anthropology in Russian. <laughs> 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 so, you know, I ended up exactly immediately with, with, with this, kind of, this kind of gift. Um, Graham, please. Well, I, I, there's a lot I could say about the, about, um, you know, Tanya Lerman's book, which was kind of hugely influential uh, on my thinking in a lot of ways. Um, and I still teach pieces of, of that book um, um, in various uh, undergraduate classes. I uh, think that your point though, about taking into, um, I, I guess I'll just answer in a very personal way. Your point about taking into consideration the perspective of kind of people in people who are our potential readers is something that that or people who are potential potential a potential audience for anthropology but maybe a legitimate peripheral participants uh, to use Jean Lave's phrase outside of the kind of disciplinary bounds of academic anthropology is something that I think I was working towards in this book, in, in Magic's Reason, because I, I think one of the places that I begin it, that telling the story of the book is reflecting back on all the times that my interlocutors and my informants were, were giving me ideas, saying, oh, you know, you should read Marcel Mauss, you should read Levi Strauss, um, you should read you know, these anthro, you should read Durkheim. And <laughs> of course, I mean, I had read all those things, but I kind of swept a lot of that under the rug at the time that I was doing field work. Um, it made me very uncomfortable because I felt that they were pushing analogies, pushing ways of thinking about anthropology that would lead me down a kind of slippery slope of this kind of evolutionist thinking because they were using that as a conceptual resource. And so I think a part of what I wanted to do in the second book was to not hide any of that. I mean, these little side conversations that you have that may or may not make it into your notes where people are really thinking about what anthropology is and what its legacy means for them. I think there's a, especially when you're working in Europe or but other any other place where anthropology is a known entity, there is a lot of that chatter. And actually what I try, rather than tune that out as noise, what I wanted to do in this book was focus on it as a signal, uh, not, not attenuate it. So thank, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now we've got a couple more questions. Again, we'll stick with the live ones. It's always fun to hear people's voices. Then we'll go to the uh, the chat ones. I see your question, Chris, but just before you uh, comes uh, Shang Sheng Teng. So, so please, if you're still with us, go, go, go ahead with your question, please. Hello, good afternoon from Taiwan. So it's actually 1 and 40 a.m. in Taiwan right now. And uh, yeah, I enjoy professors James books very much because I'm right now an undergraduate study anthropology in Taiwan, National Tsinghua University. So actually I, I want to make a confession because I am also a magician. So I've been, yeah, high five. I've been <laughs> practicing, I've been practicing magic for five years right now. 
And uh, in fact, one of the reasons that I step into the realm of anthropology is, you know, is because of perf performance magic, so, so called conjuring. So, um, in fact, this semester I, I took a class called um, Contemporary uh, Religion in Contemporary Societies. And, you know, I had a conversation with my, my professors. Uh, who's doing religious studies. And, um, you know, since she's not quite, you know, familiar with um, performance magic. And so I kind of brought out this idea and have had a, a discussion with her about connecting, in fact, kind of te teasing out the heritage and the connection between, uh, I would like to call theatrical magic and, um, anthropological magic. So I kind of differentiate these two while simultaneously um, make a connection. Um, so I kind of, um, I don't know, I'm curious about Professor Sharon's idea between this um, th theatricality and performativity and efficacy between um, like performance magic and um, and anthropological magic, because for me, um, I mean, um, th from the beginning of my like magic journey for me, um, I think magic for me is kind of a um, a worldview, a, a cosmological view. Although I do I do not have um, kind of a religious belief myself, but um, I kind of see magic as a way for me um, for like a Taiwanese in Asia for me to connect with my culture, my people, because, you know, not to mention uh, Taiwan is, uh, uh, is abundant in terms of indigenous cultures. So I kind of see magic as a way for me to kind of connect, communicate with my, um, my people. So yeah, that's kind of my comments and my questions for um, Professor Jones. So thank you very much. <laughs> How do you see it? If it's not too complicated, how do you see it as a way to connect and communicate? Yeah, so um, I have an idea about kind of um, uh, to construct theatrical magic into kind of a study and discipline. Because um, right now I see a lot of um, magicians in like entertainment industry, uh, entertaining industry, they see magic uh, primarily as um, as a way to to make money in in this you know capitalism societies. So they see magic as only um, money making tools, not a, not that much as an art form or as um, as a way to express our views on certain topics or certain ideas. So by defining um, theatrical magic, what I mean is that, uh, for instance, I care about, let's say I care about certain food and I want to convey this certain food, the, the, the enjoyment and the joy that I, I have for eating this food. But um, since I'm interested in magic, so perhaps I could create kind of a um, magical experience that translates my experience of having the, uh, the joy of eating this food into magic so I could connect um, different um, human senses into this magic instead of uh, defining magic and, and see magic as a way to like fool people and to to trick or to 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 like as a puzzle yeah so I, I see magic more as I mean, it is a puzzle and it is also a challenge, a test, as you mentioned previously, and, but it, it is also uh, an illusion and it, it has an inner reality for magicians ourselves and an outer reality for audiences or partakers or even participants. I think this is very important in terms of magic because if we come into my into you know, other art, art forms, we might see audiences as just audiences, but for uh, theatrical magic and even so-called anthropological magic, um, people are direct participants of the event itself. And it, it is contingent and it is full of like um, 
we could call mistakes and that could uh, demise the efficacy of the rituals or the events or the performance. So yeah, that's kind of my ideas about how I think magic. And, and I think it's very, um, it's kind of, yeah, it's very new, I guess, in a way in entertainment magic. Yeah. Well, I think that, I mean, I, I think that it, what you're saying resonates um, with both, I think what I was saying before about the kind of minority of magicians in France who are kind of preoccupied with the possibility of kind of transformation of magic as a kind of communicative medium that can be realigned with different or realigned with different modes of sig signification or altogether resignified. So in, in the last chapter of my first book, I write about um, about uh, a network of performers who's who are trying to create something that they call new magic, which is uh, new magic or contemporary magic that's much more closely aligned with the world of contemporary art and modern dance, and really trying to take magic out of the this kind of um, kind of mercantile association with. Um, with cheap entertainment, tawdry entertainment, and associate it with uh, the realm of high art. And for them, it's it's a cultural argument, but in for in ways that you also said it's it's an economic argument. It's a political economic argument because they say, look, if you your only opportunity to perform is at weddings, bar mitzvahs, and corporate Christmas parties you're never going to do anything that's artistically interesting. You just have to, you know, surprise people, uh, make them laugh and, and move on, you know, because it's not, you're not the primary. If you want to do something artistic, they argue, you need, you need public funding. You need funding from either the state or from, um, from foundations. And so how do you do that? How do you reposition yourself culturally so that you can, um, you can operate, operate under a different modality of cultural production? And for them in France, I mean, the, the opportunities might be different in different national milieu, but in, in France, the way that you do that is by connecting with the contemporary circus, with the avant-garde circus. And so those, those folks really linked up um, with the National Circus School, and that created a lever for them to do something totally different and very, very, very successfully, I would add. But that issue of the, the kind of resignifiability of the magical effect, what, what Katie called the technique of enchantment that exists at the core of the magical performance is something that's been a kind of guiding preoccupation for a lot of my work. And there was, because to, to tell you the real, real truth, the way that Magic's Reason started, the way that this book started was a, was a, an advisor of mine, Fred Myers, who studies art worlds, um, said, he said, you know, hasn't there been a lot of interesting stuff about circumpolar shamanic trickery? Why don't you go back and look at what people have written about the tricks that shamans perform? And so I went back to that ethno-historical record and I found, yeah, it's really interesting. If you go back to new Rasmussen stuff, he's asking people, what do you think the shaman is doing? Do you think it's a trick? And people would say, it's a trick, I can do it. I know how to do it, but it doesn't mean anything when I do it, you know? <laughs> so he, there's a very interesting history of engagement. And so in one version of what I thought the book might become, I wanted to look ethno-historically at different traditions different kind of cultural traditions in which there was a kind of differential elaboration, but also anthropological engagement with the kind of embellishment on these kind of ledger demand, feats of ledger demand. 
what ultimately happened, and so I, I even did some field work, for instance, with um, evangelical Christian magicians in the contemporary US who use tricks as a mode of proselytizing, which is a very, that raises all kinds of difficult um, um, theological and metaphysical uh, questions. I guess what happened in the end, sorry, this is kind of a rambling response, but what happened in the end is I could find no other tradition that had the kind of sustained focus of kind of anthropological and magical attention that the um, Algerian Sufis received. And I think largely that was because of the huge presence of a French population in colonial Algeria. I mean, it was a settler colonial situation. And because of the visibility that that mode of performance achieved in the context of French colonial culture. So that really became a way of signifying cultural difference. There was a kind of, um, kind of fractal recursivity about it that really amplified the importance of that in a way that I, I couldn't find anywhere else. So it, it just got its own book. But they, oh, yeah. oh, I wanted to say one, one other thing. <laughs> is I almost didn't say it because David and I had this conversation before the session started. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm sure I won't get a chance to say it. But your, your question <laughs> about the class that you took on the anthropology of, of religion gives me an occasion to say this, that, that one of the things that I wanted to do in this book, it, it wasn't just to break down the <clears throat> dichotomization of this the, the binary opposition between real magic and theatrical magic, between instrumental and theatrical magic. It, I also wanted to try to interrogate and break down the kind of network of oppositions on which that kind of pivotal opposition reposes. And one of the key oppositions, I think, and one of the reasons that to answer an earlier question by Katie, that, that I, I think anthro the anthropologists have never paid more attention to theatrical magic is that they haven't been very interested in entertainment period. And so a part of the thing that I wanted to break down is the opposition between ritual and entertainment. And so I think that what one of the lessons that I learned from working on this project is that magic as a mode of entertainment, theatrical magic, has hugely significant ritual implications in terms of the kind of metaphysical system uh, and the network of metaphysical associations that it enacts and reproduces. So yeah. I would say if you wanted to think about <laughs> theatrical magic in the context of the anthropology of religion, that there is a lot of work to do. Yeah, in fact, one way of seeing this question was that um, to use the, in the context of performance studies, like, Scholars, for, for instance, we all know the, the famous Victor Turner and uh, Richard Shagner in performance studies, and also, you know, Gavin Brown, who does, in fact, one of my inspiration was reading Gavin Brown's um, article called Theorizing Ritual as Performance. Yeah, so I think one way to, to go with the topic would be to utilize these performativity and and the ritual aspects of magic and kind of to to bridge the two like two genres almost like two brothers and sister who who like who have um like who have relationship but are lost for a long time and to bring them kind of to see each other um face to face yeah so great topic <laughs> Thank you. I, I think we have one more question. I wonder. If exactly. We... We've just got time for one more. So, Chris, let's get you into the conversation now. Thank you for your patience. There is also one more question in the um, in the Q and A. Just to uh, pay yes, attention so to as well, if we can squeeze it in. Yes, we'll, we'll see. We'll, Chris, you go first. So we give priority to the live ones, and then we'll see. So, go ahead, Chris. Hi. Can you? Yes. Um, 
Uh, so thank you very much indeed. That was a fantastic conversation. Um, I've just written a book on magic. Seems like everyone's at it at the moment. And, and I read um, Graham's book very late on in the piece. Part of the reason I wrote my book was a long encounter with E.B. Tyler. So I, I'm, I'm a, an archaeologist, not an anthropologist, but I worked at the Pitt Rivers for ages. Um, and his public statements about magic were very dismissive. Um, but almost immediately after the publication of, of Primitive Culture, he encountered in his wife's town of Wellington in Somerset, lots of magic. He found a, an onion up a pub chimney in, in the local pub, which the landlord had put there to, to harm temperance campaigners. You know, there was a witch in a bottle. There's all sorts of stuff. And, and you're right that he did go to lots of seances and stuff. And most of them, he said, are clearly bunk. But there was just one or two that he wasn't sure about. And in his letters and in his notebooks, there's actually quite a lot of ambivalence about magic. So I think, although he publicly dismissed it, he styled himself as a scientist, as a rationalist. The fact that he collected all this, he collected lots of magical stuff. Um, and kept going back to the seances and had lots of discussions. I, I think magic for him was something like an unconscious, a subconscious. It was something he, he couldn't get away from. Beneath the rationality, there was something else going on. And he just kept sort of worrying away. And he was starting before his dementia set in. He was starting to write a book on religion, which obviously magic was going to be part of. So I so I'd see a very different model and the ambivalence you've talked about in various different settings. I think Tyler had that. I think um, I think Weber as well, the whole sort of disenchantment stuff. There was a lot of loss there as well as as gain. So rather than a sort of stepwise thing, I think people are sort of I don't know quite what they're doing, seeking to to exercise, you know, and prove that they're they really are rational when they're not absolutely sure that they are. Oh, thank you. I've been asked to introduce Chris. I'm sorry. So, 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 um, uh, uh, Chris is Professor Gosden, the former director of the Pitt Rivers Museum in, in Oxford. Oh, uh, now you're introduced, Chris. Uh, go, go ahead, Graham. You've got um, two minutes before we have to stop. Okay. Just I, two. I won't say much. This sounds fantastic, and I hope so. This um, this is in your your forthcoming book, Chris. Uh, the book's just come out. There's a little bit on Tyler. There's not loads. Um, okay. Yes, but one day maybe I'll write up the Tyler stuff a bit more. I mean, that's, yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I think that, um, you know, with, I, I hope I'm not kind of using Tyler as a, a straw man in a certain sense. It's, you know, we, I, I'm working with his published materials and didn't have access to those um, private correspondence, sure. but yeah. I do, you know, one of the things of going back to Tyler and, and kind of revisiting with these questions in mind, I think we do, we're trained as anthropologists in, in the his, history of the discipline to think somewhat dismissively of the work of social evolutionist predecessors. But going back to his work in, in working on this project, I was just so blown away in a lot of ways by the materials that he lined up. Mm. There's, he brought together such an interesting collection of yeah. things and it's so provocative to think well. I, I think I might ask different questions, uh, kind of reading a thwart his interpretation of some of the materials, but it's very, very generative. Um, and I think maybe one of the ways of thinking about what Katie called an alternative history of anthropology might involve going back to some of these canonical sources like Tyler and rereading them with a much more generous eye than we're, we've often been trained to do in the midst of this kind of crisis mentality that, that we now have. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I think there's a lot more that could be in, in a positive way done on, on Tyler. And magic's a damn good place to start. Well, we're, <laughs> uh, colleagues, a wonderful discussion. 
we're out of time. But yeah, the Tylerian revival, what a marvelous way to end and surprising note to end. That's abs absolutely wonderful. So thank you very much to our reviewer for your wonderful comments. Thank you very much to our speaker for his marvelous book and wonderful presentation. And thank you to the audience. And we'll just leave um, perhaps Hanin and Ted just to close things down and say goodbye to everybody. But thank you very much indeed and look forward to the next occasion when we might meet. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>